The work we're talking about today is primarily done overseas, which is why AFSA is making the case to Congress and the State Department for putting more Foreign Service officers and specialists in the field. Economic diplomacy involves securing access for U.S. companies, providing them advice about local conditions, markets, regulations, and engaging in local advocacy. In the past year, AFSA has also published a special Foreign Service Journal edition on economic diplomacy, convened two panels on economic diplomacy topics, and released an animated video, an explainer video we call it, linking our economic work overseas to creating jobs and prosperity back home. Along with promoting American prosperity, another perennial pillar of both American diplomacy and our national security strategy <coughs> is protecting American security. And so our new initiative will focus on American security, again, drawing as many direct links as we can between the activities of the Foreign Service overseas and the lives of Americans back home. And we'll soon be releasing a new AFSA video highlighting ways that the Foreign Service help helps keep threats at bay. So today is the kickoff event for the initiative, and I am very, very grateful to have such a fantastic group of panelists here to talk about all the different ways that our people in the field protect America's national security. Uh, so I'd like to welcome, in alphabetical order, order uh, Jeffrey Austin of USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, uh, Caleb Bokelman, a DS Supervisory Special Agent, Ambassador Greg Delwey, former Ambassador to Kosovo, Ambassador John Heffern, former Ambassador to Armenia, Ambassador Deborah Jones, former Ambassador to Kuwait and Libya, and Ambassador Charlie Reese, former Ambassador to Greece. Uh, we've provided bios for all of them, so I won't go into to detail on that, except to say we are really grateful to have such a distinguished, experienced panel, and I want to thank them for sharing their time today. Um, we've got a tight time schedule because we've got a big panel, a lot to discuss, and we want to leave time for questions at the end. So in the first round, I'll ask each panelist to give an example or two from their experience about what diplomats do to protect our security at home. And I'll ask each panelist to talk for about four or five minutes on that subject. And then we'll have a second round of questions. Uh, and then we'll take another topic, the second topic, and also questions on that. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you again to our panelists. And why don't we get started? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All right. I want to say uh, thanks for having me, and I'm really honored to be here. Oh, sorry. Usually I have such a loud voice. Okay. Better? There. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm really happy to be in such esteemed company. Usually I out in the field, not uh, sitting with ambassadors. Um, so most of the the people on the panel are going to talk about protecting how diplomats protect security uh, things talking about things like post 9 11 uh, security passenger lists breaking up child pornography rings um, and those are probably what is foremost in everyone's mind about how do diplomats protect American security um, but there are other aspects of security that you may not have thought of uh, namely things like economic security um, and that's sort of the area that I work in and um, for, for APHIS. Um, APHIS is part of USDA, it's the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and it's the part of USDA that negotiates with foreign governments on the technical terms of agricultural trade. And we also work to keep pests and diseases out of the United States. America still feeds the world um, and in a globalized society um, with trade, it is ever more difficult to keep those pests and diseases out of America and ensuring American farmers are the most productive and the most prosperous. So, um, what am I here to talk about briefly? Um, New World Screwworm. What does that have to do with them? What does that have to do with uh, keeping America safe? Um, New, World, New World Screwworm was once endemic to the United States. Um, it uh, caused losses of up to 10% of American cattle up until the 1950s. Um, we've eradicated it from the United States. Um, here's a sort of a brief 
history of what what it is. New World Screwworm is the is uh, is the only fly that feeds on live flesh. So what it does, um, it it looks like a bit like a house fly. It flies around, um, and with any uh, warm-blooded mammal, it lays its eggs in any small open wound. Those eggs then then hatch into larvae, which consume the flesh of the animal, goes through the life cycle, then flies. So um, in the early 1950s, radiation was discovered as an effective technique to sterilize the flies. One unique aspect of, of the screw worm is that it will mate only once. Um, so if it mates with a, what's called a sterile male, the female fly will not lay eggs because it will think that she's already mated and that's it. <laughs> It's science, folks. <laughs> so um, this radiation was discovered as an effective technique to um, sterilize flies. Previous to this, um, what happened was that ranchers would have to continually monitor their herds, and they used insecticides to treat the wounds. Um, in 59, uh, eradication was achieved using um, the sterile insect technique in Florida. Um, then it was in 66. Uh, it was in the southwest. In 1976, however, there was a large um, reinfestation of Texas with flies coming out of, of Mexico, which caused a loss at the time of about $330 million. Um, and that led to the creation of the U.S.-Mexico Commission to, er to eradicate screwworm. It was one of the first times uh, that there was a, a binational effort to eradicate a pest. Um, USDA then built a plant in uh, Mexico, and we started releasing aerial releases of sterile flies by the millions. Um, and as you see from the map, um, we pushed screwworm all the way down to where it is now, um, to the border of South America um, in Panama. Um, in 2006, the United States invested $40 million to build a new production facility in Panama, which we call, we maintain the barrier. Um, we could, if we had much more funds, uh, go into South America and wipe it out of South America. However, budgets are budgets, so we um, keep it out of Central America, Mexico, and the United States. That is the, the production facility in Panama. Um, it's the only one of its kind in the world. Um, it is a biosecurity level three laboratory. Um, it has, when we produce more than 20 million sterile flies per week, those are then released over the Darien Gap and 20 miles into, into um, Colombia. Sorry. Um, about 400 people work here. Um, one of the rites of passage for any ambassador who goes, who's posted to Panama, is to tour this facility. Um, and it's always an interesting conversation for the APHIS attaché there to tell them, because it's a bio-level security three lab, you must shower out. So you go in to a giant locker room and you put on overalls, you have to take off all your jewelry, nothing is allowed. You tour the facility, which is uh, basically a giant factory that that we breed flies um, on blood. Then we sterilize the larvae and send them out via aircraft. That's the top right, that's the workers um, producing um, the flies. Um, basically, if you had a close up, it looks like a whole bunch of larvae feeding on a on a blood meal. Um, the bottom right, those flies, the, the flies then are loaded up into aircraft and we fly them. We take off and fly um, across Panama and then 20 miles south into Colombia and we uh, maintain that, that barrier. Um, we also have the capability of responding to outbreaks in the United States in 2016. Um, there was an outbreak of New World Screw in the Florida Keys. I'm not sure if anybody remembers that from the news, um, but it was a, a big deal. Most likely, um, flies came from Cuba, either via migrants or um, from the weather. 
Um, the U.S., we were able to respond immediately and release um, several hundred million um, sterile flies over the Florida Keys. Um, we instituted a uh, agricultural barrier where no, um, no <coughs> livestock or animals, including dogs, um, were allowed out of the affected areas. We did things like inspections and... <laughs> to, to eradicate them. It took about three months, um, but we were able to eradicate it from, from the keys. So what does this mean? Why is this important? Um, farming, ranching is incredibly important to the United States agricultural economy. Um, there are 94.8 million cattle in the United States. Um, I didn't count the number of sheep and goats. Those are less, but probably 30, 40 million of those. Um, the estimated cost of an outbreak, um, $1.5 billion um, in estimated e economic loss if we had a significant outbreak, um, say in Texas among, among feedlot cattle. Um, it would close um, markets to American cattle for a significant period of time. So that's a, that's a fairly, would be a fairly significant hit um, to the broader economy, as well as in, in those really affected areas um, would cause a lot of economic damage. Um, prior to eradication, herd loss in Texas was esti estimated at 10%. Um, the, the cattle size in the United States is significantly larger than it was in the 1940s, so that would be millions of cattle lost to either morbidity or um, they would not be economically viable due to, um, even if they survived, um, due to uh, damage to their the meat as well as the, the hog. Estimated livestock losses to, to screwworm in the Southwest um, in 1960 before eradication was $100 million annually. So that's, that's a, even then was a significant amount of money that that the economy hit was taken um, prior to, to the eradication efforts. Um, eradication of New World Screw in the United States yields annual economic benefits um, overall to the economy at $2.8 billion. Um, the cost of this, of maintaining the, the gap, the budget is $15 million. So for $15 million, we protect $2.8 billion worth of of economic activity in the United States. So that's just one example of how um, USDA, APHIS, um, protect the American people. Um, there are, the New World doesn't, while we're, I was talking about its impact on cattle, um, New World School Room does infect people, but to a much lesser extent. Um, so it is both a economic benefit to people as well as a human health benefit. Um, so that's sort of my As always, APHIS talks about the really gross stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I admit, uh, I just learned a lot. And this is our foreign service at work protecting the American people in, in ways that uh, we need to get out there because it's, it's real. Um, thank you so much, Chef. And now I'd like to turn over to Kayla for different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first I'd also like to thank uh, Absol for putting this together. I do believe very strongly that getting our message out there and our stories out there really does make a difference. Um, we know that DS and the department, we are that that global force that's in a unique position to keep America and our partners and our allies safe and secure. We do this in so many different ways every single day, uh, and most of our stories go untold and many times, unfortunately, unthanked. Um, but one of the ways that we do that, and I'm gonna talk about that today, is we combat head-on transnational criminal organizations. We go to the source and we meet them where they're committing the crime. And by strengthening our partners, borders, and laws, 
it, it, it strengthens the integrity of our borders and our laws. So when I was first approached to write a, an article for the Foreign Service Journal, I didn't hesitate. Um, now, six to nine months later, when I actually got around to writing the article, <laughs> I made a statement that I, I, I said then, and I still stand by it now even, which is diplomacy solved the case. It couldn't have happened without us all working together. Um, me as a DS agent, but the embassy as a whole, making human trafficking and child exploitation um, a, in, a, a priority and in the forefront. It also took diplomacy to organize and collaborate with and coordinate 140 agents, prosecutors, and judges in two different countries to simultaneously, simultaneously execute 11 arrest warrants and conduct 13 search warrants in order to take down a very prolific international child pornography ring. So, like I said, there's a lot of diplomacy. If you know uh, law enforcement at all, we like to argue about everything. So, um, but that wasn't all that we did that, that day. And like I said, it took, a, it took a whole of an embassy approach because I also want to talk about what public affairs did for, uh, for Costa Rica and also to help me with my, my colleagues down there. They set up an IVLP program that was specifically targeting uh, human trafficking. And it was my colleagues that went on that, that training. And that also helped with the six other human trafficking cases that we worked while I was down there. The political section, they worked with Costa Rica in order to strengthen their TIP laws so that when we actually arrested people, they actually got punishments that fit the crime. If you want to talk about a punishment that fits the crime, although, again, we're talking child pornography, I'm not sure there's any punishment that fits that crime, the main perpetrator of my case got 747 years. Now that is, is that was well worth the time. Um, and finally, um, when, I, when I spoke to INL and I said, hey, you know what, there's a, there's a flaw in Costa Rica's uh, border system and their computer systems that are, that is allowing transnational criminal organizations to utilize Costa Rica as a hiding place, a transit hub, um, both you know, international and Americans coming through Costa Rica, they went and they fixed it. And it really didn't cost, it was, as far as I know, it was under $50,000 to fix that. So every day we are out there making a difference in people's lives. Um, and when I say that we literally save lives, I, I don't just, it's, it's not just nice words to me. It means everything to me because we do in so many ways. And it, was, it really hit home for me um, when I was standing out there that, on that June 8th day getting ready to, to conduct the search warrant on the main perpetrator's house. Um, we go in, just so you know, he did cry when we arrested him, which there wasn't a lot of sympathy, but they always do. So they always cry. As I'm searching his house, as I'm helping to search his house, I open up one of the closets, and in there was literally the clothes that the kids had been forced to wear and display in their modeling shoes. It broke my heart, just like it breaks my heart now thinking about it. And I can't actually think about the case without thinking. But with that, we were able, obviously we, we were linking obviously the, 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 the whole network to the crime, um, but with that, that final straw, that is, that is ultimately what helped us finally bring down this ring completely, and, and all of them are getting convicted. So <clears throat> to say that, you know, again, what we do matters, it really does matter, and we really do save lives, and we do it in, in, in a multitude of ways, just like I said earlier. <coughs> And so I thank everyone here for all their hard work. Um, and I just want to give again a shout out to ASA. Thank you very much for uh, letting us get, get these messages out. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Professor. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, uh, ASA. Uh, so, I uh, thought I'd talk a little bit about how the country team in Kosovo, where I was chief of mission until about a year ago, uh, tackled uh, several jihadi problems related to ISIS. Uh, kind of, when I, when I agreed to do this, we cared about ISIS. Uh, I'm not, that may have changed. Things move fast in international diplomacy. Uh, but uh, Kosovo, for those of you who have not been there, is a very pro-American country. 80% uh, of the people in Kosovo love the United States. And the next country down is like 40% <laughs> approval rating. Um, 
which is not surprising since we saved literally a million people from being refugees or dead in 1999. But of course, not everybody likes us. Uh, and for a while, around 2010, there were more Kosovo citizens per capita going to fight with ISIS in Syria and Iraq than from any other country. These were mostly not American fans. So that was problem number one. Problem number two was that eventually many of these people were going to come home to Kosovo uh, from the Middle East. So starting with problem number one. Uh, Kosovo, always the poorest part of Yugoslavia, is a poor country. It's got a weak rule of law, poorest borders. Uh, it only became independent in 2008, and the majority of the population is Yugoslav Muslim. Illegal radical imams recruited, over the course of several years, a few hundred people to go fight with ISIS in Syria and Iraq to help rescue the Muslims from Assad. The inexperienced Kosovo government came to our embassy and said, what do we do? We have no idea what to do to solve this problem. We know it's a bad problem, but we don't know what to do about it. So our embassy, this is all before I got there, worked with the government, worked with INL and the legal bureau uh, to draft laws that basically prohibited citizens from traveling to other countries to fight in their wars. These laws were passed by an assembly that, for some, that most of the time doesn't like to pass laws. Uh, but the impression in Kosovo that the magnitude of this problem kind of helped even the horrible politicians in Kosovo get something done on this. Uh, so these laws that were passed by the assembly combined with intensive community engagement that we also helped with, that was directed at who? How do you deal with young men who are trying to go abroad to cause trouble? You talk with mom. So community <laughs> engagement uh, focused at, uh, towards the mothers uh, of the kind of people who are at risk of going to the Middle East uh, really helped bring down the number of Kosovars moving to the Middle East uh, by 2013. But all told, there were about 300 Kosovars who went to the fight over the years. So, but we really helped uh, clamp that down. Now moving on to problem number two. Of the jihadis that did go, some of them died in the fight, some stayed, and others realized it wasn't really as nice as everybody said it was gonna be, uh, and a hundred or so decided they wanted to come home. Now, once these people were back in the country, the law still applied to them. A lot of people were investigated, they were prosecuted, they were arrested, and they were imprisoned. This is very unusual in Kosovo, by the way. That all of these steps in the rule of law chain actually worked. Um, so Kosovo is a European country. It's got European-style prison sentences. So these jihadis were going to get out of jail pretty soon. And Kosovo needed to learn how to deal with the problem of what to do with these guys in prison and what should happen to them when they got out. So one problem for us as the American Embassy was the correction service that ran the prisons was completely corrupt. So we hadn't worked with it in the past. We didn't know people. Uh, but that was balanced by the question of what the heck are we going to do about these violent offenders who are going to get out in the next year or two are going to be a threat not just to Kosovo, but to the United States and our American Embassy. So despite the corruption risk, and after considerable internal debate in the embassy, I decided that we had to tackle the issue and that I personally would take responsibility for any negative fallout if something went wrong. But then we still didn't know exactly what to do. We needed help. So what do professional diplomats do when they have no idea how to deal with the problem? They ring the bell and they ask for help because they're smart people in the United States government who know how to deal with a lot of problems. So, we called on INL, like uh, Kayla, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement to help to identify money and help. INL sent in teams to talk with the corrections people, analyze the situation, and propose solutions. I went in to see the Prime Minister personally. I told him how we intended to help. I asked for his support, and I warned him that I would publicly denounce him if there was any monkey business related to our program. Ultimately, we signed a deal with the Kosovo government that we would provide advice to the correction service on the issue. Best of all, INL was able to come up with Mike, 
a retired prison warden from Washington State who had worked in Indonesia on this exact same set of issues. He would spend a week or two with us every couple of months for two years. Mike was instrumental in our successful strategy. Mike understood the coastal dynamic. Apparently, Indonesia was even worse, hard to believe. Uh, I explained to Mike the corruption problem, and I said, I don't want to give the correction service any expensive US government funded gadgets. Let's just deal with procedures and with training. Mike developed over the course of several visits ways to deal with these violent offenders while they're still in prison, which is basically you put them all together and you segregate them from the regular prisoners so they don't corrupt the uh, regular crooks. Uh, he lays out a plan, works with corrections officials, local psychologists, social workers, and starts training them. He helps the local team start talking to these offenders, try to talk them off their jihadi orientation. Not a 100% successful problem. But you don't want to just let these guys go out on the street and say, have a nice life. You got to try to do something. Mike developed a system to notify the police in these guys' hometowns uh, when they were about to be released so the police could keep an eye on them. So by the time I left, which was about a year ago, even though we, a few former GID prisoners had been released, we had no cases of recidivism, <coughs> no domestic threats by a former jihadi, and no return to the Middle East. So it was a success, I think. I got a few lessons from this experience. One, once we decided there was a USG problem here, <coughs> a potential threat to the embassy, we could not fail to act. Two, we knew there was a risk of failure. The correction service could have stiffed us, find a way to steal the money, whatever. Nevertheless, we went ahead. Three, I said I would accept the risk personally. I knew I was going to retire at the end of the assignment. So <laughs> <laughs> not that big, uh, not that big a deal for me. Uh, but that allowed everybody else in the embassy to focus on solving the problem uh, and not worrying about what might happen to them if something went wrong. We did four. We did extensive planning with experts. Five. We hired people who knew what they were doing. Mike. Uh, and that is one of the great benefits of working with I. <coughs> if you need a prison warden, if you need a drug policy expert, if you need a community policing person, I know can find someone who actually did that work in the United States, and they will come and help you. So, and finally, this is not a one cent, one answer problem. Like most real world problems, it requires strategy and it requires multiple steps. And I will stop there. Thank you, Greg. And as an INL veteran myself, I appreciate the shout out. Um, it's well deserved. Okay, I'll move to the last thing. Eric, thanks very much, and thanks to AFSA. Uh, AFSA now more than ever. I think we'll all agree uh, on that. Uh, I do have an Indonesia story, and it is perhaps even more complicated than Kosovo. <laughs> Big, complicated country. I've got a quick Indonesia example and then, a, then an EUR example from NATO as well. I arrived in Indonesia in 2006 as a DCM. And this was right after two uh, major bombings in Bali, Kuta Beach, Bali, major uh, tourist center, Westerners, Indonesians, everybody uses those, uses those beaches. Bombing in 2002, 200 killed, 200, 200 injured many Westerners. 2005, at least a couple of Americans also uh, among, among the injured. So it became obviously a, a top priority for the embassy to work with the Indonesians and work with the interagency community. That's my main point, is the interagency cooperation that we developed in, in Embassy Jakarta to deal with this, with this threat. And our goal was obviously, first of all, to protect Americans. Uh, Americans traveled to Indonesia. Uh, businessmen and women lived there. Uh, plus, uh, uh, Jim Islamiya had links to Al-Qaeda, so there was an international uh, or potentially global element uh, to, to, their, to their terrorist activity. So obviously it quickly became the embassy's top priority. We had an inter interagency team on anti-terrorism, interagency team on law enforcement that worked very closely together. We had, it was all state-led, uh, all the key state uh, offices were all there, DCM chair, the committees. Uh, we had the Justice Department, uh, we had obviously all the intel agencies, uh, plus DOD was there. This was the, the, during the Bush-Cheney time, so we had uh, the MLEs, can't remember what that stands for, 
and the misters, uh, and, and I can't, stand, can't remember what that stands for either. Which we've ever wanted to worry about. What are these guys and gals, these special ops guys, going to come and do? Uh, Chief of Mission Authority was was not their first priority. So it's very interesting to, and then uh, we also had USAID obviously as part of the team because we wanted to help Indonesia develop the institutions like Greg talked about to deal with their, to deal with this problem, the rule of law and other parts. Which USAID was perfect uh, to help us with. So we worked these interagency uh, groups. Uh, we said we obviously we changed the travel advisory. The RSO worked closely with the business community through the OSAC, the Overseas uh, Security Advisory, something or other. Three, uh, and, and to try to make the our business people understand that changing routes and times and all that is not just a, is not just a slogan. I mean, it really is meaningful a meaningful thing. And there's a sad ending to that uh, that happened shortly after I left. And, we, and so we worked very closely with the with the Indonesians. The MIST team set up a rewards program, got some information on some of these bad guys, uh, which uh, led to some, some, some positive results. I don't have all the good, the good stats that Dr. Delaware has. But we did, we did, we had a good success with the Indonesians. The Indonesians were committed uh, to take on this struggle, and this state-led interagency team uh, did the necessary, I think, during these during this period to try to uh, De decrease the problem. Didn't solve it, still not solved, uh, but I think we made a major contribution in Indonesia to try to deal with this problem. Shortly after I left, uh, there was a Western uh, business group that had their monthly breakfast always in the same hotel, always at the same table, and unfortunately there was a bombing and nine of them were killed. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, uh, a serious message that we try to uh, convey to, to, to Americans and others, uh, and others overseas. Uh, Fast forward 2001, uh, September 11th, 3 p.m. Brussels time, I'm in a committee meeting. Multilateral organizations have lots of committee meetings. So I'm in a committee meeting, tapped on the shoulder, the United States has been attacked. Come back, ambassadors called everybody back. We had a career FSO uh, ambassador, uh, Nick Burns, career FSO DCM, Tori Newland. Put the team together, very close coordination with our DOD colleagues. Obviously, US NATO has many, many Pentagon, uh, a major Pentagon uh, uh, contribution. And together, we worked with the Allies, worked with Washington first. Washington didn't know what they wanted the Allies to do. So we worked with Washington to come up with a plan, got the Allies involved with Afghanistan, and regardless of what you think about Afghanistan, in 18, 19 years, and all that's happened there, the fact is the Allies and the partners stepped up I know Tom got a Georgia flag on there. Georgia, major contributor, 30 plus killed, I think, uh, in the uh, ISAF and uh, RSM, RSM efforts. So major efforts, again, state-led efforts. What we know how to do, we the State Department, we Foreign Service, is put together coalitions and to get allies and partners to do stuff we want them to do and to stop doing stuff we don't want them to do. But that's what we do best. And we we're, were able to do that at NATO uh, to try to get the allies and partners active with us to take on uh, the terrorist threat that we saw coming out of Afghanistan through those two operations. I won't say it was successful, but it was, it was a major, uh, major effort. We did get everybody involved, and hopefully the long-term impact is going to be successful. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. transition, John, into um, a more granular, but dealing with ambassadors and military relationships, because of course my two assignments as ambassador were in Kuwait, where we have up to 13,000 DOD uh, staff at any given time, and then of course in Libya, where uh, <laughs> our staff was largely military and largely special forces, and I think in light of the recent um, a killing of al-Baghdadi, I can give you some insights onto how an ambassador works with those kinds of operations as well. Let me do the Kuwait one quickly because it actually kind of overlaps with some of what you mentioned earlier on. 
uh, we, act, we had the accidental introduction of H1N1 into Kuwait. We had a number of forces there, and we actually owned Camp Arifjan. That was a gift to us from the Sheikh at the time, from the ruler, Sheikh Yavin, um, following the uh, liberation of Kuwait. We also have several other, <clears throat> at least 10 other installations where we operate pretty freely, Camp Uring and other places where our troops go and transit in and out before going into Afghanistan or into Iraq at the time. I was there from 2008 to 2011, which was also the time when we saw the withdrawal of our massive, our major number of troops from Iraq. But during that period of time, we had one of these very circular U.S. government situations where um, troops from Fort Hood who were coming out to Kuwait, some of them were actually infected or had H1N1, had the, what I guess we call swine flu or whatever it was called at the time. And we were unaware of it initially because um, the way that we bring troops in and out of Kuwait is very compartmented. They actually rarely touch Kuwaiti soil. In some ways, they come in by transport. They were either taken immediately by US transport to Camp Arifjan or to Camp Buring. And um, so we never really considered that this was a problem. However, our very um, efficient and uh, good uh, section, uh, State Department office of, um, over, uh, I can't even remember the office it was now, had pinpointed the fact that what had happened is a few of these soldiers had emailed their moms home and said, I arrived in Kuwait, I was very sick, I didn't feel well, I had a fever, and it turns out, mom, I have swine flu. So this made the press in Texas. And of course, then was tracked down by our very good State Department people who, who were tracking down, I can't remember, what's the office that tracks diseases? We have one that actually um, yeah, well, no, no, but CDC is national, but we actually have at state an office that works with UN. It's an IO office that tracks these things. And of course, then they wanted to publish this. And they had gone out on one of their websites and said the presence of swine flu is here, here, and here. And being Kuwait shows up on the map, um, much to our surprise and much to the unhappiness of the Kuwaiti leadership. So to just make a long story short, the role of the ambassador, because fortunately I knew I had gone to the, the National War College uh, with John Allen, who was then the deputy of Petraeus in, in Iraq. These were troops that were headed that way. And I also had, you know, ambassadors have that unique relationship with the ministers within the country as well. So we were able to work out a deal quietly all the way around to get our folks at home also to withdraw Kuwait as a pinpointed area of swine flu, which for them would have meant all kinds of changes at border, of port of entry and everything else, um, but to keep our troops flowing. And that's a minor, that's a kind of a small example, but that's the relationships that we have, having interacted with our military, having gone to war college, so that you have the personal relationships and the contacts you have at government levels at the top allow you to do things to keep the flow going that otherwise um, might become a road bump. The other one's a little uh, more, you know, I guess thrilling or interesting. But in uh, Libya, and, and I want to underscore, this is the role of an ambassador when we actually have, no matter the condition of the country, there is a government, a putative government, and we do have relations with them that we have to abide by. So when I had arrived, we had several missions that were already in planning stages. Um, two of them involved, well, one involved a, a, an individual, a Libby, who had been involved and implicated in the bombings in 1998, um, had been involved in the planning and conduct of, of the bombings of our embassies in, in Nairobi and, uh, and the other one in, in, sorry, in Dar es Salaam. And I think, in fact, he was more involved with the Dar es Salaam, I'm not sure now. And also Abu Katala, who was implicated in the attack on our um, facility in Benghazi in which Ambassador Stevens and three others uh, ended up losing their lives. And then there was a third that was a kill operation. These first two were capture operations, the third was a kill operation for Mukhtar Bill Mukhtar, who was a, uh, actually not a Libyan, was a transnational uh, a terrorist who had been in, implicated in the attack on El Amina, the oil a station in Algeria in which Americans had died as well. So what is the ambassador's role in these circumstances? First of all, because the White House at the time, which sets the rules 
for how things go, particularly in a kill operation using employing a drone, um, we had a standard. No more than eight, you know, how many uh, individuals collateral damage, where it could take place. You have to notify the host country or select who you notify in a government that's highly uh, fractured. I always assured people everything we did in Libya while I was there was done with the knowledge of a senior, the most senior individual in the government at the time, without necessarily going into the specifics um, to, the, to that person as well. Um, but you also, in the case of, um, of the first two operations with the special forces who were in, in Tripoli, we actually had to, almost a daily coordination. They did a lot of planning. As you know, these guys plan and plan and plan, these guys and gals, because there are females in the components as well. Um, you do dry runs. There's a lot of consulting on the impact this will have on the cultural uh, factors that play into it. Um, and, and even down to the approval of the date of the, what we, they call the POD, the period of darkness, when they're actually going to conduct the operation. And I will tell you here, it's, uh, you know, I can, I'm retired, but in the case of the, of the capture of Libby, it almost went really south real fast because after all their planning and they're planning to go after him on a day, he would travel alone to mosque every day and he was in a fairly rural area, and we had, and they had done this dry one a thousand times. They knew where the safe house was, how they were going to exfiltrate him out of the country. And suddenly, I got a message from the head of the team, um, letting me know that because we had worked out a little code that had to do, I think, with my dog's name, the cat that lived out at their facility, and the fact that Halloween was coming up. Mm -hmm. And and he let me know that they had actually that they were going to move uh, within the next 24 hours. And I said, can you come and see me? Mm -hmm. Because the day that we put them on was Friday, which we all know, Friday, well, we don't all know, but those of us who speak Arabic know and her as their Arabic know or people who've been in the Muslim world. Friday is Juma in Arabic, which means the day of gathering, and which means the day that everybody's at the mosque and on the way to the mosque. And I said, why are you doing this today of all days? because the White House wanted to coordinate uh, two PODs at the same time, one in Somalia that did not go well, and the one in Libya. And so what happened was the guys went, grabbed him, captured him. They had not realized that a CCTV camera had been set up at his house. Within three hours, uh, the family had contacted the New York Times and I was summoned into the Prime Minister's uh, office, his temporary office at one of the hotels with, and then he brought in his intel chief from a side room who was livid and furious and how could you do this to us, et cetera, et cetera. And they, I'll never forget, they asked me, so where is Olivi, who was a Libyan citizen at the time? And I always remember, as I've always told my children in our business, there is a difference between perfect truth and complete truth. And I said, he is currently en route to the United States, which he was, eventually, he was in the process. He was sitting in Libya, and all I could think of was, let's hope that they are so incompetent that they can't cover the, the sea, because that's how we took him out eventually. And then, of course, that, that one, that was one. Abu Qatullah, we actually, they actually respected and waited until the ambassador, the chief of mission, approved their operational plan, because this one was much more complicated, involved many other pieces, was going to take place in Benghazi, where we of course did not have a regular presence, and their initial plan was so filled with so many parts and uh, you know areas that could go wrong, or, or segments that could go wrong, and in fact we discovered via Twitter, because the ambassador had a Twitter account, that attacks had started on Benina Airport, the area where they were planning to drop, um, by militias and other groups. Eventually, though, we, we worked very closely together. I worked very closely with the, you know, the AFRICOM commander, but also the combatant commands and the special forces commands. Again, the kinds of relationships you build over decades, working together with these guys in a number of places, these guys and gals, and eventually we all agreed on a plan and as it worked out, it worked out like clockwork. They were actually able to lure him into an apartment um, on the seacoast and within a matter of two hours they had him in and out, out of the country and on the way back to the United States, which was great. 
In the case of the, the, um, the kill, sorry to be so blunt, but that's what it is. Again, there are all kinds of restrictions on where this takes place, um, how can it happen. Of course, the Libyans were fine with the fact that it was a non-Libyan and understood. We didn't tell them who it was. We said it's a non-Libyan. This is what we're going to do, blah, blah, blah. But I'll never forget um, the sensation, because I was actually in Rome on negotiations with, you know, political negotiations involving Libya, and got a message that said you need to go into the chief of station's office in, in Rome at the embassy, um, because we think we've spotted him and we want to act within 24 hours. But again, their respect, the role of the ambassador was really important on this, because it also, you carry responsibility for what happens in your country, and also blame for what happens in your country. It doesn't go right. And I'll never forget being brought in and being shown through a pipette, basically. I mean, it's, you know, looking down and seeing this very grainy figure that was clearly Mukhtar the Mukhtar as he ceremonially shaved and bathed one of the guys who was about, that's how we knew that they were about to take part in an operation, because they were going through the whole ritual of cleansing beforehand. And so I gave the okay. I said, fine, looks like that. Obviously that when, when you say the White House and else looks good, looks fine. He's in a place that's isolated. Um, we can do this. And so that operation went ahead. Now, would you believe it? He actually survived that initial piece, but was, a, was so, so injured that he um, died within months. But again, that combination of having the access to the intel working so closely with the military who, who really do want the guidance of the political leadership in the field and want to feel secure in their decisions based on your informed advice and also the fact that you have a relationship with the political leadership in Washington that knows gives them a bit of cover as well. Made a lot of difference. So anyway, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of drama on the end of the, the part of attack. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, last but not least, yes, Thank you very much, Eric, and thanks again to ASA for doing this. I, I think I agree with everyone in this room that uh, diplomats uh, abroad, diplomats even in Washington, are among the first line of defense. Uh, and our engagement in the security issues, as uh, Deborah just laid out, as everyone has laid out, uh, John, uh, makes our security much better, much more um, agile, and much more um, uh, successful. I got two quick examples um, drawn from uh, two different circumstances. First, let me take you back to 2001, after 9-11, uh, early 2002. Uh, we were standing up uh, a big reform of the way that we handled integration and uh, intelligence, identification of um, potential uh, threats, uh, particularly having to do with airliners. And one of the early ideas was that we would require airlines to supply passenger name record, full passenger name record um, uh, data to uh, what later became TSA prior to the planes taking off. Now, when I first heard about that, I said, well, don't they supply a, a manifest when, when planes uh, fly to the US? Well, they do. But PNR was uh, some 30 different data uh, points, uh, including credit cards and meal preferences and all kinds of other things. So at the time, I was Principal Bass uh, for the European Bureau. And drawing on our uh, great network of uh, counselors and ambassadors in the field, we realized, actually, that imposing the passenger name record requirements on European airlines as a fiat and as a national we, we, uh, the concept as it, as it emerged here was to go to countries one by one, Germany uh, for Lufthansa, the, the UK for BA, et cetera, and imposing this on them. And that, the problem with that is that there is actually European legislation from then, it was from 95, that imposed privacy requirements on transfer of such sensitive data. And we um, argued, uh, based on the intelligence and the insights that we were getting from the field, that we ought to keep our eye on the long-term prize, and that we ought to negotiate what I used to call a process trade with the European Union, whereby we would agree to negotiate and to deal with this with them as a collective if we could have an understanding ahead of time as to what the outcome would be. 
And uh, make a long story short, we succeeded. We did an early agreement in 2004. The European Court of Justice uh, struck that down in, in 2006. But because we had the commission on our side, uh, we did a new agreement in 2007 and a final agreement in 2011 that is legally secure. And as a result, uh, passenger name record data is applied uh, to the TSA and the intelligence community prior to uh, planes lifting off, and we're all much safer as a result. Other example I'd like to uh, uh, mention is a little bit like Deborah's, is a, is a little bit more dramatic. Uh, early in January or mid January of 2008, I was ambassador in Athens, and you get one of those phone calls you dread getting uh, early in about 6 a.m. Got a phone call from the um, uh, the RSO saying, uh, "Ambassador, I uh, got some bad news. We just took a rocket into the side of the Chancery, um, and we're not sure. It looks like the Marines are saying nobody's injured." Uh, and we spent at 6 a.m. And uh, but we're not. Uh, we're, we're you know uh, searching for uh, problems and we're securing here and all the rest. We closed the embassy. Uh, everyone rendezvoused at uh, the residence a couple of blocks away, and we took stock of the situation. Now, uh, keep in mind, Greece is a country with the uh, November 17 domestic terrorism group uh, that had only been rolled up several years prior, and the um, uh, fidelity or the, uh, uh, the commitment of Greek uh, uh, internal security uh, to protection of uh, uh, both uh, Americans, British, and uh, senior Greeks to uh, November 17 terrorism was a little bit in doubt. And so one of the things that we uh, immediately uh, surmised was that this rocket was actually an RPG uh, from across the street, came from one of these uh, successors to November 17 groups. And what was vital from my standpoint, our long-term objective was to make sure that the Greeks were sufficiently motivated uh, to go after this, but not to humiliate them. And so uh, what we do is what my mother used to say was kind of assume the best, your best intentions. Uh, and um, so we were watching the television and we got news that the Greek press, as they often do, were um, essentially making up stories about what was happening inside the embassy. We were burning files, the CIA was, you know, panic mode and so forth. And I went out uh, on the street corner, uh, uh, kind of against the advice of my PAO, who said, we need Washington's approval before we take any line on this. And I said, I'll apologize to you. <coughs> I went out on the street and I explained that you know this terrible thing had happened. It was awful that someone would have such an idea. And that I knew, I was confident that the Greek um, uh, Greek minister, ministries would work with us to find the perpetrators and bring them to justice. And in the meantime, I, as a throwaway line, made an apology to all, everybody who was tied up in horrendous traffic jams because all the roads had been shut off. Now that was uh, a, a throwaway line, but 20 minutes after I did that, the foreign minister wanted to come to the embassy and stand out in front and talk to the press. <laughs> 15 minutes after that, the Minister of uh, what they call public safety, public order, but his Minister of Interior also did the same. And we had absolute fantastic uh, cooperation from the Greeks. They were, of course, their initial reaction was the Americans were going to blame them and their faulty uh, security uh, arrangements. And uh, about three hours later, when they woke up, I actually got a call from Condi Rice thanking me for the whole approach. So I didn't have to apologize. <laughs> the reason to tell the story is really that uh, a lot of times when you have um, a diplomatic presence on the ground and, uh, and connections and insights that uh, John and, and uh, Greg and, and Deborah mentioned, you have the opportunity to take a longer view and to understand what it takes to motivate um, uh, your host government and to motivate your host government in the interests of promoting uh, our joint security interests. And I think that's the, what we try to do in that case. So with that, I'll turn it back there. Thank you. Thank you. I think just in this brief discussion today from our panelists, we've had uh, a really good sense of what our colleagues in the Foreign Service are doing out in the field. And I don't think a single person mentioned going to receptions 
food and records and drinking, drinking cocktails, and that's because um, those stereotypes are, are so wrong. I think we heard a good uh, set of examples here today. Um, in the interest of time, because I think we want to leave time for some questions, uh, what I'd like to do is just pass the microphone down the table and ask our panelists for a very brief, let's say one minute maximum, uh, thoughts on what the next set of challenges that are facing our different lands overseas are, what are the, the things that are, that are coming at us that we need to be prepared for, uh, and then we'll open up for questions. So why don't we just pass the mic down? Okay. okay. Um, the rising threat of you know global pests and diseases, especially as they relate to agriculture and moving around the world, um, it affects not just the United States but the world. Some very, very quick examples, um, African swine fever moving rapidly around the world, uh, affecting China probably most significantly at the moment. China's lost maybe 20% of their swine population. An interesting factoid to use at your next cocktail party, um, China's releasing pork from their national pork reserve um, in order to meet domestic, um, to keep pork prices low into this. So those kind of things. Um, we see cartels in Mexico moving into avocados because avocados is such a pricey commodity. Um, things also things in Central America talking about migration. Um, we do mango exports. You know, every job in a mango plant keeps 40 people from moving from to the United States. So as you're out there thinking about all of these security issues, everything is relates to everything else, and agriculture, agricultural trade, um, and development, it's all interrelated. And so think about one thing, think about the whole picture. Thanks. All right, from my perspective, I would have to say it's uh, cyber, cyber security and cyber crimes. Um, Cybersecurity, we have to ensure that our information and our networks and our platforms are secure uh, now and going forward, especially as 5G starts coming online and China pushing that. Um, cyber crimes, because criminals and criminal organizations and terrorist organizations, they're only becoming more sophisticated. The iPhones and the devices we have in our pockets have more computing power they say, than the astronauts had on their, their first landing on the moon. So of course we, we have to be able to be we have to meet that rising challenge and that takes agents and it takes training and it takes resources um, because the the criminals have them. Uh, well, I could see it in my case. By the end, we had to have a Bitcoin account. Uh, nobody was training me on Bitcoin. I had to go out and learn that. Uh, I did make some good money off of it. I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> um, so but, but we, but we, we do have to, and I'd have to say, from also from my perspective, the one thing I'm seeing from our, our partners around the world is requests for training in uh, technology so that they can as well combat, combat these, uh, these organizations. Because if we can't link the monsters to the money, as I like to say in my other case, uh, we can't get them, so. Thanks. Uh, from my perspective, one of the biggest challenges we're gonna have is to rebuild our network of uh, like-minded countries. Uh, that uh, has deteriorated over the last uh, couple of years, unfortunately. My the next event, uh, I will talk about uh, my role in counter piracy. Did anyone see the movie Captain Phillips? Tom Hanks yes. is yes. Okay. Uh, that uh, that shows the U.S. Navy taking out some uh, some people who kidnapped uh, Tom Hanks and rescuing him uh, during the piracy crisis off the coast of Somalia. That was all pretty much true, actually. Believe it or not, for the movie, it's pretty good. Uh, but that's not what solved the problem. What solved the problem of piracy off the coast of Somalia was people from the State Department, from the Coast Guard, from the DOD, of course, uh, building a coalition uh, of countries, 30 countries, uh, that we managed out of the Political Military Affairs Bureau, where I work, uh, to tackle all of the problems that cause piracy. Uh, military was an important element of the solution, but it was the minority of that solution. We solved that problem over the, by 2011, 12, 13 because we had friends and allies around the world who worked with us on it. Uh, so that is a challenge that we've got to be prepared for in the future, whether it's piracy or some other kind of weird thing out of the past. I want to second uh, Greg's comment. I think our major challenge, our major threat is uh, loss of trust in us. 
uh, overseas, and I think that's going to have a major, is having a major impact on Intel sharing and coalition building. So I think that's our major threat. Yeah, and I, just to put a stone on that, because I agree with that a thousand percent, I think that two issues, collaboration and competition, um, are going to mark the future, and our competition, our competitiveness as a nation is going to be affected by the ruptures we have within right now, because we're so focused on the political debate that we're not focused on, you know, learning cyber technology, on, on the things that we do need to work with to prepare us to collaborate with like-minded countries and peoples and, and entities, I mean, private, public, all these other things that, that are going to help us um, compete successfully with the 5Gs, with the, you know, Huawei's and all of these other things. And instead, we're squabbling amongst ourselves. It's a disaster. And our education is suffering. Well, I'll make this easy. I, I certainly agree with, uh, with that. I mean, the security these days is a team sport that requires allies, it requires management of allies, and certainly that's when we do it right, uh, our security is enhanced, and when we do it wrong, our security is undermined, and that's certainly what we need. We need a team to deal with Greg's returning jihadist problem, we need a team to deal with technology, we need a team to deal with cyber problems, and other countries have an important part of what it takes to make Americans safe. And what you use diplomats for is making sure, to the extent you can, that other countries cooperate with the US on these high priority problems. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask for a round of applause for our panelists. and I really uh, think if we can just capture some of this and get this out to the American public and that's one of the things that we're going to be working very hard to do and we welcome support uh, with the Speakers Bureau, with others to get out, hit the road, do interviews uh, and uh, try to explain to our fellow citizens what exactly it is we're doing for the American people. Uh, with you got that, a hashtag for this event, uh, Master? Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Got a hashtag for this event? No? We don't have a hashtag for the event, but uh, we just have great the ability to, uh, to we can put it whatever, whatever hashtag yeah. you want okay, to we'll tweet it. We will yeah. tweet it. Um, thank you. Um, and um, what I'd like to do now is open up the floor to any questions. And I don't know, do we need to mic the questions or are we okay? I, I think we're okay. From we're okay with just, speak, if you just speak up, we'll be fine. In the back. Hi, my name is Catherine Miller Morgan. I joined in 20, uh, 2004. Um, I was in Jakarta and was lucky enough to work for Ambassador Heffern when he was a museum there. Um, and when I got there, and throughout my 15 year career, every now and then I got to sit down in a high level conversation because DCMs would invite us to and so forth. And that renews my ability to continue to want to help our country and our people and I'm emotional because I care and thank you because this renewed my commitment thank you so much don't give up, don't give up. Uh, just as a point of clarification regarding the eradication of the screw worm isn't that hoof and mouth disease rather than swine flu and if so are there differences in between those are the all two programs? Those are all different diseases. So right. we have eradication efforts for hoof and mouth disease that we. Oops, um, those are all different diseases. Um, screw worm is one example. Um, foot and mouth disease is a, is another. Economically, it's probably more devastating. But um, yeah, those are separate eradication efforts that USDA has. We but the one that you were describing, was that hoof and mouth or no, was that swine flu? No, no, that was uh, New World Screw Worm, which is the uh, insect pest, not a disease. Right. Move on this side. Other questions? Got a little bit of time. Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, to do everything all of you recommend all of all of your uh, proposals requires resources, including a steady flow of new people coming into the respective uh, departments and agencies. Um, is it correct, I've heard that the number of applicants for the Foreign Service exam has plummeted to less than half of what it was three, four years ago. 
Is that correct? And is state and AFSA doing any and other agencies doing anything to to uh, improve the image of the Foreign Service and get good people in the pipe? Uh, maybe I'll take the question uh, to start. Uh, it is, first of all, true that applicants to the Foreign Service, I believe in all of our agencies, uh, are down, and actually um, the State Department number is down by three quarters since the high point in 2010. Uh, that said, uh, we still uh, did have about 6,000 applicants this year for several hundred spots, so it still remains very competitive. Uh, this is something that we are discussing uh, as an association with the Director General uh, and with department leadership. Uh, it is multifaceted. Uh, the good news is thanks to congressional direction, uh, there has been a significant round of hiring in, I think I can say, all of the foreign affairs agencies uh, in the past year, and we now have uh, a series of entry-level A100 classes uh, for, for officers, uh, specialist classes, and I do know that in some of the other agencies, including AID Commerce and Agriculture, uh, they are bringing in a significant increase in uh, new foreign service people. So um, the good news is we do have, and the people coming in are incredibly impressive. I've been meeting with every class, uh, and uh, both the, the generalists and the specialists also uh, we just met with the, the new AID incoming class. Uh, so the good news is the Congress mandated spending on new hires. We're getting a significant new uh, set of colleagues, uh, but it is true that applicants are down, uh, and it's a complicated question why, uh, and it's something that we do want to help address uh, with uh, the leadership of all of the agencies. I don't know if anyone else. Can I jump in on that real quick? Please. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Mike. Oh. At Georgetown, I'm, I'm now teaching at the Foreign Service School there, and obviously that's a key uh, source of, of applicants for us. Uh, and every class, every meeting I have with them, I get this question, how can you work for these, these folks? And, and all that, obviously I've worked for lots of folks and disagree with all sorts of stuff that I, I didn't agree with all my demarches, you know, for the last 36 <laughs> years. Um, but but it was, I know it's different now, in terms of values and all, so it, it's, a, it's a tough conversation that we need to have with them that, that if we cede the field to these folks, then it'll, it'll stay like this. The idea is for us to stay in as long as we can and for the good people to come in so that we can uh, get, our, get our values back. Great. Other questions? Sure. Um, thanks for Thank you. I, I, one of the common themes I think I heard in, in many of the presentations, and, and really thank you all very much because I think it was very instructive to hear some of the specific stories, was um, how much you're uh, looking at a problem first involved analyzing, obviously analyzing the problem, um, thinking through the ask of <coughs> the counterpart, the other country, the other uh, group that you were dealing with. Um, and, and shaping that in a way that they could get to yes on, and then helping them, in fact, get to yes. I wonder if you could talk, though, a little more specifically about how that process was built, if you will, on the, on the relationships you cultivated in the field, um, and why those relationships and that sort of uh, forward deployment and, and building those relationships was so important to actually getting to the, getting to the yes, getting the agreement, reinforcing U.S. national security. Charlie? Uh, I'll start out by imagining everybody has uh, insights on this. It, it, I remember being in London in the uh, 90s when the internet sort of first took off and representing the embassy at a conference on the sort of future diplomacy at the University of Westminster. And the idea uh, being touted at the time was because of instantaneous communications, because of the sort of then uh, revolutionary changes in the news uh, uh, cycle and system, that we really didn't need big embassies abroad to let us know what was going on because policymakers in capitals could figure it out themselves based on all this great channels of information. And that was, you know, in a sense, organized from the standpoint of the Foreign Office, which was concerning what embassies they should shut down and so forth. And I actually believe. Uh, and I think uh, subsequent experience has proven true that what you need is not just information, but relationships, insights, and strategy that you get from having um, uh, a, a 
major presence uh, at various levels uh, with the host government and with uh, think tanks and policymakers and business communities and everything else that you only get by having an, uh, an embassy. And the more chaotic and um, robust, shall we say, the international information network is, the more important the, that uh, capacity to uh, understand what works and what doesn't work. Uh, it, it, it's just it's just vital. There's no question about it. Yeah, I would just PS on that. That I think our influence as ambassadors or members of the mission um, come from the countries, our country's credibility as a nation and its consistency and its reliability. And so, when you speak for the United States, people know that you can deliver on what you're saying. And, and it's also, it, so it's that in the background, and it's about listening. I think it's about listening to what the other side needs as well, um, instead of just going in and saying, this is what we want to do, this is what we need to do, um, and we need you to do this for us, you know, jump, pop, stuff. It's never that easy, even with, and I discovered that even in a place like Kuwait, where I think many Americans mistakenly assume that we own that place because we liberated it. Well, that's not how Kuwaitis see it. You know, by the way, young Kuwaitis don't even remember the liberation. Um, of Kuwait, which, you know, so I think it's it's those factors, again, and, and it's having your country team be all on one line, also, it's discipline, and it's the discipline that we lack, or seem to lack right now, um, because this is a hierarchy, I mean, policy is a hierarchy, it doesn't mean you don't spread out and grab, and I think as everyone has pointed out in their examples, that you're drawing on a number of uh, expertise at all levels and across the board and all levels of our society. But at the end of the day, people have to know that, that there's a policy, that there's a credibility, that there's a commitment, um, and then they can decide whether they want to go along with that or not, as you discuss and as you offer something for them as well. I always used to tell people there were rules in the sandbox in the Middle East, just as when you're a child. And it's, um, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> Right? Um, learning how to play telephone well so that by the time messages are transmitted, they're coming out the same way at the end as when they are originated, so they're credible. And at the end of the day, if your dad's bigger, you have a certain <laughs> oomph, right, in the, in the game. But it's, but it's all three of those things that really matter in, in the way we deal with others. Quick additional point. In Armenia, one of our major goals has been, I assume it still is, is to wean uh, Armenia a bit away from Russia. They were still very close to Russia as a former Soviet country. Depending on Russia for all sorts of reasons. And the way we did that was to present a positive story about what they would get from partnership with the West. We didn't just bash Russia this and Russia that. We did that occasionally, but, but the idea was to, to, prevent, to, to present them with a positive uh, alternative uh, economically, investment, uh, NATO partnership uh, to try to wean them away from Russia where we could. Just, I agree with everything that's been said, I, Andrew. I think one of the key questions, one of the key things to keep in mind is that in contrast to the kind of comic book understanding of the world that we see too often among our political leaders, the work that we do is not because we tell foreigners to do it and they do it. Even in Kosovo, the government wouldn't do exactly what I told them to do, with our 80% approval rating. You have to talk people into it. How do you talk people into wanting to do something? You have to have a relationship with them. You have to build that over time. And that's what diplomats can bring to the party. Uh, for me, it was it was all about relationships. Um, I had worked a couple other human trafficking cases with the prosecutors and the agents, and they knew that they could trust me, and they knew that I was going to do uh, what was best for the case to to solve it. Um, I didn't know anything about I, mean, I, I know stuff, but. I didn't know anything really about working a child pornography case. So I said, look, I'll put you in touch with the FBI or HSI, and they can do it. And, and, and I'll still be the lead agent, but you know they, they have the extra expertise. And they looked at me and they said, Caleb, we wanted to work with those agencies, we wouldn't have called them. If we didn't, we called you. And at that, at that point, that, that solidified that relationship. We could do anything together, and that's what makes it so important. Thank you for the question. I think it's an excellent question. All, all of that, it's the same when you're sitting and negotiating, working out the details on a trade deal. It's being able to sit down and have a relationship with your counterpart. You can't bully anyone into doing what you want. Maybe one time we could, but those days are long gone and probably never should have done that.
place. But it is about getting to yes, and you can only do that through a relationship. Great, thank you very much uh, for those comments. Let me just add two brief ones of my own, and I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I, I just want to second what uh, I think all the panelists were talking about in terms of the value of relationships which are built on the basis of expertise and experience and understanding, which is not something that can be easily uh, created or recreated by uh, the value of the thousands of years of experience that our, our foreign service colleagues bring to the table is so important. And that's why this institution is so important. Because without that, you can't just come in cold. And uh, without relationships, without understanding how to do this, uh, do it properly. And the second thing I'd like to echo is the importance of bringing something to the table in terms of solutions and benefit. Uh, many of my uh, former ambassadorial colleagues in this room uh, were involved in some of the uh, demarches on the 5G problem in China, and that was one of the most frustrating uh, things that I had to deal with uh, as ambassador in Bulgaria because our instructions were to say, don't do this, and then when the question was, well, what do we do instead? The answer was, we don't really have anything to suggest just yet. Yeah, trust exactly. Trust Trust And, uh, yeah. and exactly. that was one of the best. And so we pushed that and said, we need some concrete kind of suggestions if they're not going to buy from, from Huawei. Then what are they, who are they going to buy from? What are they going to do? We'll get back to you. So that's not how it's done. Um, and we need to, to bring to the table real alternative solutions. Uh, and that is something I hope uh, we will see going forward. With that, I think we have time for one last question, if there is one. Uh, yes? It's not a question, it's just to contribute to the discussion about relationships. So I'm a public diplomacy officer, and of course, as we all do, um, we start, I started as a consular officer. So first, starting with security, the consular officers, to me, are the first line, right? The people who are every day looking at every visa applicant, every passport application, every report of birth abroad, to see if there's fraud and fault or anything. That's something that I think was a part of this discussion, but I think as we continue over the year, I would very much like to bring in that set of colleagues. And as a public diplomacy officer talking about relationships, I believe the number has been about one third of world leaders have come to the United States through one of our exchange programs. And if I remember correctly as well, I haven't read it myself, Tony Blair's biography starts with a line about the most important trip I ever took was on the International Visitor Leadership Program, right? So in talking about relationships, part of the way that we create those relationships are showing people who we are, not just telling them, and then when they go back to the you know, to their home nations, which are host to us, to us, we're lucky to meet them on the other side. And that's how I've gotten a lot of my work done, and I think how a lot of us have gotten our work done when you walk into that ministry and someone relates either to your accent or the region you're from or whatever, that's a first breakthrough. And then you can have the conversation after that. So two plugs, consular and public diplomacy. Yeah. Eric, Thank you, know, you very much. Can I just say something too? Is yes, I'm a consular phone officer and I, I mean, I did you know three tours and then kind of left in NEA, but um, it has been astonishing to me to see the absence of any State Department consular official in any of the national discussion of immigration. And so therefore there's a lot of, I wouldn't say misinformation per se, but there's an absence of information. So that there's been nobody conversant with the INA. There's been nobody who's talked about applying it. I never see Janice or any of our kind of senior former consular people who, and I don't know, are we not offering them up to CNN or, or the NAP or Fox or anyone, I don't care, you know, but to, to talk about the actual nuts and bolts of what a consular officer does when you're looking at applications and what we're assessing, because then things come out of the blue like it's news that there is a, a public charge category, for example, which is in the law, it's always been in the law, the difference is the policy was always in the back. You know, I always said when I was doing visas in Buenos Aires in 1982, um, and the only time we ever heard from a Congress person was when we denied a visa, because then it was their constituents, it was their family's constituent, and all that changed with 9-11. But nonetheless, and the same thing, if anyone ever tried to apply the um, the clause about, uh, you you know, the, the I think it's 
212A27 or something, the public charge clause, you would be overthrown immediately because you'd say, no, everyone can go to the, the United States and get a job, you know, and our economy is flourishing. You know, so, I mean, I just, um, that strikes me, what you're saying, that I, I don't see State Department involvement on the consular issue, the immigration issue, and it should be there, I think. Thank you, and you say thank you for that yeah. really important comment. And, and Deborah, thank you for that. I would just add uh, one comment that uh, when you don't have a single career assistant secretary of state, including yeah. Yeah. in CA, this is one of the consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's one of the reasons we're pushing so hard, uh, hopefully at least for the next administration, to return to having senior career professional uh, leaders in these positions, and in at least some. So uh, with that, I think we're out of time, but I do want to thank, first of all, our panelists for some really interesting, stimulating uh, comments. Uh, I learned a lot. I think together it presents a very compelling picture of all the things that our foreign service does for the American people. I want to thank uh, all of you for coming and for your questions. Uh, and uh, we will continue uh, this program, this focus on national security going forward. One last word I did want to make several people, one comment I wanted to make several people have asked about our legal defense fund. And um, the good news is uh, we've had a tremendous response from our membership and our colleagues in the Foreign Service. And uh, we have uh, more than, I think, doubled, I think we've come close to tripling uh, the fund in just a few weeks. Uh, a lot of people are getting questions from those outside, uh, asked of the Foreign Service about donating. We are working hard on that because uh, our members need approval from the Office of Government Ethics to accept money from outside, and those donations probably have to be screened and recorded, and we have to have a mechanism for that uh, to vet them. So we're hoping within a week or two we will have an agreement to go forward, and then we will announce uh, the opening of this to outside donors. If you have people asking, write down their names, keep a record. We'll go back to them as soon as we can, but I did want to thank everybody here who may have donated. Uh, I think we're, for now, in good shape, but I'm, I'm not uh, relaxing on this because I'm quite sure the need will continue and grow, and we're facing a difficult year ahead. So thank you for your support, thank you for coming, and uh, to be continued. Thanks to, to all of our absolutely.